very excited for our webinar titled Advancing in Vivo Insights, Mastering Bioluminescent Imaging for Dynamic Biological Studies. I'll introduce today's presenters. So we have Dr. Andrew Van Prague from Spectral Instruments Imaging and Dr. Thomas Kirkland from Promega Corporation. And we're very excited that they're joining us here today to go through um, in vivo bioluminescent imaging and I will let them take it away. In today's webinar, I'll be starting off with an introductory review of the essential features of in vivo bioluminescent imaging, or in vivo BLI for short, and discuss how this imaging modality has been traditionally used by preclinical investigators. My colleague from Promega, Tom Kirkland, uh, will then present some of the newer bioluminescent substrate systems and demonstrate how they have optimized in vivo BLI sensitivity and expanded the range of research applications uh, and insights that can be gained from using this modality. Now, by way of a general overview, a in vivo BLI experiment will always have three central components, an enzymatic light producing reporter construct in an animal model, and secondarily, there will be the injection of a substrate formulation that the enzyme will act on and produce light. And thirdly, there will be a imaging device that will detect and record this device and allow for an analysis quantitatively of this optical imaging data. Given this framework of in, in vivo BLI uh, and with the idea of understanding it uh, at a greater depth, it's helpful to address the following fundamental concepts. Essentially, what is in vivo BLI? What exactly does it, uh, is involved in generating that light data? And what does in vivo BLI imaging look like in the lab? And the data itself, how does it uh, appear to the investigator? Without any further ado, optical imaging in general is the detection of visible light photons starting at around 400 nanometer going up through blue, green, yellow, orange, red, and into the near infrared at about 900 nanometers. The photons themselves that are getting detected are typically produced in one of two ways in optical imaging, either through bioluminescence or fluorescence. And we will be primarily focusing on bioluminescence today, but I'll pay homage to both and show you the mechanics of each. So with bioluminescence, basically, you're dealing with an intracellular enzyme that with its substrate and various cofactors can go ahead and generate light. In the particular example shown here to the left, we're looking at firefly luciferase, which has delucifrin as a substrate, cellular ATP and oxygen, and magnesium ions as a cofactor, and it will generate light um, in the presence of all those constituents. Now, fluorescence, is a very different mechanism. It generates light as well in the visible and near infrared spectrum, but it requires an external light source. And essentially what's happening is you get the excitation of your fluorophore, your fluorescing molecule. Um, you get the excitation of specific electrons in that molecule that will then rise and immediately fall. And in going back to their native state, generate a longer wavelength of lower energy light. And that fluorescence too can be detected and recorded. So typically for both bioluminescence and fluorescence, you will be using a cool CCD camera system that will have a very high sensitivity for these photons. And basically it will record it on its sensor. The sensor gets read off and put through a set of algorithms and software platform and presented to the investigator for further analysis and evaluation. Optical imaging in the lab, this is what it looks like. You will have an optical imaging device in connection with a monitor to interface with. And of course, you will have, as is shown in the central image here, a anesthesia system, typically a uh, isoferane vaporizer system that will put the mice to sleep. So they're not moving during your image acquisition. And assuming that all goes well and you get good data, you will also get a happy investigator. All right, so what um, the setup looks like has just been shown. This is the data that you can get, okay? And essentially, the way that optical data is presented is through a lookup table that will present uh, the intensity of data on a certain color scheme. So in this particular case, we're using rainbow. 
and the high intensity data will appear red, the low intensity will appear blue. And you can see that there's a, a, a variety of intensities within each optical loci. What we're looking at here is an ectopic tumor model. And what you'll also notice is that the optical data is not presented alone. It's typically presented with a white light image in the background to give better location information on the optical imaging data. Now, fluorescence, as a last reference to fluorescence at, uh, in, at this moment, is going to look very similar, right? Uh, it's generated by a different mechanism, uh, as we discussed, um, but the light signal itself will also be presented using a lookup table, can be a, the identical one that you use for bioluminescence, and um, you will similarly co-register it with a white light image. So now, having reviewed what in vivo BLI is, how it works, and what it can look like in the lab, the next set of questions really address um, how to set up an in vivo BLI model. And then once you have a model in hand, how is it effectively used? In other words, what are the key strengths of this imaging modality? And ultimately, what kind of insights can be provided to the preclinical investigator? So as we noted, you have the generation of light. Not all luciferases are created equal. They will have peak emissions that have distinct uh, nanometer wavelengths. And there are a range of uh, spec performance aspects to any reporter construct. And Tom will go over some of the, um, the things to make note of in choosing and selecting an optimal, an optimal luciferase reporter construct. So in general terms, what I'm going to talk about here is how do you get a luciferase system set up? So typically, there are one of two ways in which you can get luciferase to um, be expressed in uh, your mouse model system. You can either tag cells ex vivo in a in vitro uh, transduction setup, and that basically is a direct viral vector transport of the luciferase gene into uh, the cells of interest, and this is uh, commonly done with a lentil viral system. Alternatively, um, you can use a, a method where you're using transgenic mice and you're inducing the expression of luciferase in a subset of cells within that mouse model. And this is typically done by a in vivo transduction protocol. And as an example of this, you can take a deno associated virus that can carry Cre recombinase. It'll recognize certain repeat uh, sequences in the genome um, that are locks repeats, and if you flank locks on either side of the area to be removed, i.e. if you have a floxed um, a component of the genome, it can get eliminated by the action of pre-recombinase. And as an example for luciferase, you can have a stop codon that's removed, and then luciferase expression will be induced, and you'll have luciferase enzyme in that cell subpopulation of the mouse. So that's how a luciferase system will get set up in a mouse model system. Now, the next question really is, having set this up and knowing that you're empowered with the ability to do in vivo BLI, what does this really give you? Okay, Essentially, an overview, it gives you a non-invasive, real-time, high-sensitivity monitoring capability for the cells of interest in your model. And the exact advantages that this gives you are going to be elaborated in the next set of slides. So to start off with, in vivo BLI is highly sensitive. Okay, We're talking about a molecular level imaging modality that is able to detect vanishingly small amounts of photons per unit area per unit time. And the actual expression rate of the luciferase enzyme is, again, very, very low. So how does this translate into an experiment setup? Well, in the example off to the right, you have an orthotopic lung carcinoma model where nude mice were challenged with human lung carcinoma A549 cells that were um, transduced to express firefly luciferase. The cells were injected to the tune of a half million via tail vein, and at two hours post-injection with substrate injection of the mouse into the IP, you were able to see the signal of those cells trapped in the capillary bed of the lung. So as early as two hours post 
in, uh, challenge, you are able to detect where your cells are. And this early onset of detection can be hugely valuable to any preclinical investigator that wants to know on day one that they have set up their model correctly. Now, we have, uh, on this particular instance, um, carried out our observations to about nine weeks, and you can see that the optical signal data increases over time, suggesting that the uh, orthotopic lung cancer model was proliferating and that the cells were increasing in number. And sure enough, if you go to a cellular level imaging modality, like MRI or micro CT, at this nine week time point, you can see peripulmonary nodules very nicely, and you can see a uh, increased density developing in the lung space. However, if you use these cellular level high resolution imaging modalities and go backwards in time, you can see that at about four weeks, you have nothing. So this is the difference with high resolution cellular imaging, it may take weeks to actually see the pathology, whereas with optical, functioning at a molecular level, you can see it within hours. All right, so the next advantage of in vivo BLI is that it's incredibly fast, okay? Five to 10 seconds as shown here is typically all that you need to acquire adequate signal data. Along with that, you have these large uh, fields of view, or FOVs, that enable you to image as many as 10 mice at a time. Put that together, and you have a very high throughput screening modality. And the advantage here is that with high N for your target, you're able to develop a, a very tight standard deviation around a mean for any given signal um, type in your model. And as such, you are able to detect significant differences between treatment groups quite easily. So here's an example case scenario where what we're looking at is an advanced, uh, or I should say an aggressive uh, T-cell leukemia model, and the mice were um, basically not skid mice that were um, irradiated non-lethally, but essentially wiping out their immune system and then challenged with uh, human T cells that were previously transduced to express luciferase. On day three of the study, the mice were grouped and given various different treatments over a 21 day period. And on day 24 of the study, you can see that the combinatorial therapy of the test drug AZD and the standard of care pontinib, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, basically significantly reduced um, the detectable signal. And indeed, if you do a, an analysis p-test, you can see that you had significance of the combinatorial therapy um, versus vehicle um, nicely established. And again, this is made possible by having a high throughput number of mice that enables you to get a high end for your stat analysis. Okay, I have a follow-up here. The, this group also within the same study did a more robust um, uh, uh, clinically relevant uh, experiment by allowing engraftment to take place. They did not start treatment until 14 days uh, after the initial challenge with the uh, leukemia uh, injection. And so what you see here is exactly the same result. Uh, you have significant uh, uh, reduction by the conotoral therapy. The new thing is that even the standard of care pontinib uh, on this engraftment model had some significance. And so in total, what you're seeing here is the ready capability of in vivo BLI to give you statistically relevant um, data with regard to any kind of efficacy uh, efficiency quite readily. No one got out of this one alive. All the mice died, but there was longer lives uh, demonstrated by the conotorbal therapy receiving mice. And that's the overall perspective of, of that paper. All right, so it comes intuitively that given that we're uh, imaging um, whole mice over time, that it's not invasive, right? The, this is the, one of the great strengths of in vivo optical. There are two things that are really happening here. One is you're following a single cohort over any time course that you may be doing. So you're using fewer mice. That is always good. Um, additionally, you are avoiding a source of variability, which will be if you have a single treatment group 
that has multiple cohorts in it and you're sacrificing them for tissue and doing histological anal analyses, let's say, um, you are going to introduce an internal variability within that treatment group by using multiple groups. Um, that's avoided completely by being non-invasive. And so again, um, you're improving the uh, statistical strength of your data. Um, with the multiple mass uh, non-invasive imaging, you're also able to uh, very rigorously look at the distribution of your cell population of interest over time. And in this particular example, we have an orthotopic uh, 4T1 breast tumor uh, model, again, transduced with firefly luciferase, and you have very early onset detection of a low cell copy number metastatic lesion at four and a half weeks. This can be very valuable in characterizing the phenotype of any particular kind of pathology. Now, um, in this study, there is the same demonstration of following uh, cell populations using um, a luciferase. The thing that's interesting here is that we're using two different luciferases for two different populations. And Tom will get into the exact uh, luciferase reporter constructs here. Uh, what I would like to point out briefly is that the uh, tumor challenge that was given to these mice was done in the left uh, flank region, and it's expressing a given luciferase. And you can very nicely see its signal here. Now, CAR T cells that specifically recognize this tumor were then used to basically um, treat the existing tumor mass um, by uh, binding to them and having their effector functions um, activated. What you can see in this instance is in the top right image, the CAR T cells that specifically recognize the tumor have a very restricted distribution, whereas CAR T cells that don't recognize this a specific tumor, a different lineage of CAR T cell, the distribution is much more diverse. And so this is proof of concept behind the efficacy of a specialized CAR T cell population against a specific tumor. All right, finally, optical imaging in vivo BLI um, need not function alone as an imaging modality. There are many systems out there that will allow you to basically co-register not only on a white light image of the mice, but onto an X-ray image of the mice. And this can be very valuable. Um, what we're looking at here is a, a B cell lymphoblast um, challenge where, again, B cells have been transduced to express luciferase, tail vein injection. We get signal in the lung, as you would expect. That's where the first capillary bed is. But we also have a secondary site in um, the knee joint of these mice, which is very interesting. And to confirm the precise location of that secondary loci, uh, set of loci, you can do x-ray and, and indeed confirm that the secondary location for the, um, the B cells is in the knee joint of these mice. All right, so having basically seen all of the features that in vivo optical imaging can provide with regard to its highly sensitive, non-invasive, real-time, high throughput monitoring of cells over time, there is a whole range of uh, constructs that can be set up experimentally to evaluate certain relevant uh, pathology questions. And they're listed here. And I'm not gonna go into detail here to describe all of them, but suffice it to say this, is that they basically have relevance in a wide range of areas of study, okay? From oncology, immunology, immuno-oncology, inflammation and fibrosis, bacterial and viral infections, cardiovascular disease, and arthritis. So that's the baseline um, of how in vivo BLI operates and where it can be used. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Tom, who's gonna to talk about some very interesting newer uh, reporter substrate constructs for in vivo BLI. Thank you very much, Andrew. So as Andrew said, I'm going to jump off um, from basically the baseline of understanding what BLI is and how it's used and talk about both the luciferase and luciferin, what I'm going to call bioluminescent systems, some of the newer ones that have been developed over the past 25 years since the first BLI experiments were done around uh, the year 2000. 
So specifically, I'm going to talk about an exciting new luciferase that's really become an exciting secondary luciferase to use in conjunction with firefly luciferase, and that's an analog luciferase. And I'm going to explain why the unique properties that this luciferase has really makes it interesting for doing experiments that would not work well with fire luciferase and also make it an excellent multiplex with fire luciferase as Andrew has already alluded to and I'll go into that experiment into more detail soon. In addition to talking about the unique properties of the enzymes, they really don't do anything without the bioluminescent substrate which is what the enzyme acts on to generate an excited state that then emits a photon. So I'm also going to talk about how these substrates have been developed to work well, and again, focusing on the nanolux luciferase substrate, and talk about you know, the improved dosing and distribution that make these really ideal for BLI. So I want to start this part with discussing the properties of nanolux. So nanolux is a luciferase that was developed from a deep sea shrimp. Um, the original luciferase was called a plophorus. It was an AB tetramer that did does generate quite bright light, but it had a bunch of properties that were not ideal for use in mammalian cells. So there was many rounds of evolution that were done and also a bunch of chemistry that was done on the substrate to generate what we now have as nanolic luciferase and a new substrate, which is called furimazine. And this is a monomeric species. It's a 10 strand beta barrel. It's a small luciferase, it's only 19 kilodaltons. Thermostability, it's got an extremely good linear range, it's extremely bright, it's approximately a log and a half brighter than both vanilla luciferase and firefly. It's monomeric, it's ATP independent, and because it has no disulfide bonds, it's equally functional inside and outside of cells. And this system was developed and is quite effective as a biochemical um, bioluminescent system and a live cell system. However, being interested in also applying this system to BLI and mice particularly, there were some challenges here. So although Nanoluck has the, the exciting properties that I mentioned, um, it is a blue emitting luciferase. So as Andrew showed earlier, blue is not the ideal color for tissue penetration. So it would be better for detecting photons if they were redder on the spectrum. A more challenging issue was that furimazine, while an excellent in vivo substrate that is used widely, it does have solubility and PK challenges in terms of injecting it into mice and trying to get the substrate to distribute to where the nanoluck is within the tissue. So a project was undertaken to improve both of these properties. So I show here a construct called Antares. And so in the teal, you have uh, the nanoluck, and what you have fused to it are two fluorescent proteins um, that are known as Psi-OFP. These are long soap shift fluorescent proteins that absorb in the blue and emit in the orange. And this solved much of the problem of having a blue emitting luciferase. So these orange photons are much more tissue penetrant than the blue. But even more importantly, as it turns out, um, once we had this construct, we did a large MedChem project to make modifications to the structure of furimazine and generated this structure that you see in the center of the slide, which is fluorofuramazine. Now, this has relatively modest modifications in terms of atoms changed, but it turns out this both dramatically increases the solubility of the compound, allowing it to be dosed in mice much higher, but also improves the biodistribution of the compound. And so while most um, marine luciferase substrates, typically using cylindrazine, need to be dosed IV and have very fast um, excretion and so thus have very quick peaks, fluorofuramazine can be dosed IP and it makes it a much um, longer kinetic so that it is much easier to get to the imager and detect um, a signal at the flat part of the peak. In addition, it can be dosed in a number of other ways IV, RO, SC. And so this substrate is quite exciting for use with nanoluck in BLI. So I mentioned that um, there, are, there have been a number of developments with new um, luciferin and luciferases. This is an example of one that was published in 2018 from the Maki group. Um, this is Akaluk and Akalumine. So Akalumine is 
shown here, this structure is a modification of deluciferin. It has an extended conjugation, so it emits in the near infrared. And once this substrate was developed, a, um, mutations were made to firefly luciferase to make something that was then dubbed Acaluc, which is a specific luciferase, as is shown in this figure here, that does not interact with deluciferin as firefly does, but does interact brightly with acalumine. And this is a bright and well-penetrating uh, bioluminescent system. And not only has, was this shown to be excellent in mice in terms of having very good tissue penetration, they did an experiment in marmosets where an awake monkey could be shown walking around with bioluminescent activity in the brain. So this has been a very exciting version of firefly luciferase and is one of the currently most popular next generation firefly systems. And so with that introduction, I wanna come back to the model that was introduced earlier. This is basically the, a multiplex model where Akaluk was introduced into T cells. And this is the model that Andrew explained where there was one set of mice that were injected with T cells that recognized the tumor antigen and one set of T cells that didn't. Each of them were transfected with, nan with Akaluk. Um, the tumor, was created um, expressing Antares. So it constitutively expressed Antares within the tumor. And then once the tumor had been established and the T cells injected in the mice, um, the two substrates were injected sequentially. So fluorofuramazine was injected on one day. The signal purely from the tumor was measured. And because fluorofuramazine does not interact with firefly luciferases at all, there was no signal from the T cells. The next day, acalumine was injected, and because, again, you have complete orthogonality, only the T cells gave a signal with the acalumine injection from the acaluc, and no signal came from the tumor cells. The, the signal coming from the tumor was all due to T cell infiltration. And so here's an example of that sequential in, injection. So on day 17, FFZ was in, injected, and the tumor lights up brightly. On day 18, you can see the T cells still have not established well, so you get a fairly diffuse and non-bright signal. Then on day 29, with the T cells that are responsive to the tumor, you can see that on FFZ injection, you get a very faint signal. This is due to the tumor having been mostly eradicated. But you see that the T cells are still quite present, and you see quite a bright signal from the acaluc acalumine system showing the T cells still at the site where the tumor is being eradicated. And this allows longitudinally for the signal to be graphed and the response to tumor to be shown in, in this graph over time. So you can see that the T cells are injected here. Um, and then you see this inflection point where the signals are both growing at the same rate, but then as the, the T cells that recognize the tumor antigen start to do their work, the signal of the two, from the tumor cells decreases, whereas the T cells that don't recognize the antigen have no effect, and you see the tumor just continues to grow until these mice had to be sacrificed in the control group. So this is a strong example of an experiment that really depends on having two orthogonal luciferases to see distinct types of biology happening within the same animal. Uh, this is another example that I wanted to show using Nanoluck BLI. Um, this is using a different construct. So it isn't required, although PsyOFP is an excellent acceptor for energy from Nanoluck. This example uses a different um, red fluorescent protein, um, M scarlet. And so the, in this case, you have M scarlet being fused to Nanoluck, and then that construct, uh, that fusion protein is prenylated and embedded into the membranes of exosomes. And that gives you a construct, which you can see in this image, where the membranes are brightly lit up with a red fluorescent protein. You can see that with both fluorescence, because the fluorescent protein is fluorescent, and also with bioluminescence. And then these were able to be imaged both in vivo in the mice. And then another thing that I wanted to highlight in this experiment is Nanoluck is also quite effective for ex vivo imaging. So in this case, the 
um, the distribution of the exosomes which express this fusion construct were tracked by FFZ injection into mice, and you can see them. That's all here in this paper if you'd like to refer to it. But after the experiment was done, the mice were sacrificed, the organs harvested that you can see here in this image, and then by adding an analog substrate, you could see quite clearly which organs had bright signals, such as the lungs, where the exosomes had accumulated, and then other organs, such as the liver, had little signal or the brain. So in addition to being able to do in vivo imaging with NanoLuck and NanoLuck-based systems, you can also do ex vivo imaging. And this is quite effective because NanoLuck is ATP independent. So in this case, you could not use a Firefly luciferase system because luciferase is not inside a cell with access to ATP, so it would not be active, whereas NanoLuck is independent of ATP. Another example of using NanoLuck for in vivo imaging here is with tracking the, infect the infection of a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, this was done both initially in cells that express um, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 that had been engineered in. So the virus was made with an analog fusion. In this case, because viruses are quite sensitive to the size of the fusion, um, unfused nanolock, there was no fluorescent energy acceptor here. This is just unfused nanolock on the virus. And they could see that if they added the virus to the cells and they had an, an incubation time, then when they added the substrate to the cells, they saw a bright signal um, indicating that the cells had been infected with the virus and it was producing nanoluck. And this is an example of then taking a mouse, which had also been engineered with a human ACE2 receptor, that is what the virus uses for infection, and then this nanolock fused virus was able to be um, injected into the mice. And then after some time, you could see that it localized to the lungs and there was a bright signal obtained. Now this here is an example of a tomographic image of so this mouse is rotating and you can see that you can see the signal in 3D. And another thing that I wanna point out is that while lungs are considered deep tissue, they're in the center of the mouse, even though this is unfused nanolock emitting blue light, because nanolock is so bright, if the expression is high enough, you can still see a relatively high resolution image from that blue light emission. So even though it is often encouraged to use nanolock fuse to a fluorescent acceptor that shifts the light because that does give you better tissue penetration, it doesn't mean that unfused nanolock is ineffective for in vivo imaging. And in fact, this is one of several examples where people have used the blue light of nanoluck and can still see the signal that they're looking for in a live mouse. So I've talked quite a bit about peripheral imaging with um, fluorofuramazine. I want to mention a little bit about the brain. So in brain imaging, it was found by our research group that fluorofuramazine, while it does penetrate the brain, has odd distribution and isn't as bright as we would expect within the brain. And so we found a different analog, which we're calling cephalofuramazine, which shows bright, even distribution throughout the brain. And that can be seen in these two images, which are from two different um, protein drivers of Antares within the mouse brain. And so this substrate shows good distribution and allows a strong signal coming from the Antares, which is present in the brain, wherever it is in the brain. And so this is a, the substrate that we are recommending for CNS use. And here's an example, and I wanted to show this example both to highlight uh, functional imaging within the brain. So this protein construct here is called CAMBI, which refers to calcium, um, calcium responsive uh, nanoluck based system. So this has a calmodulin domain, which is fused um, to the center of nanoluck, which is then fused to the CIOFP. So when calcium binds, you see a change in signal due to the change in conformation, which um, reconstitutes the nanoluck activity. This is another example that I haven't emphasized yet, which is that nanoluck is quite readily engineerable to be a sensor. So in addition to being a bright luciferase, and therefore really exciting for imaging with BLI, 
It's actually quite interesting for functional imaging as well. This can be used to sense metabolites by the addition of a, a metabolite-sensitive protein fused to the nanolock. It can also be used to sense things like protein-protein interactions, where you can take pieces of nanolock, and then when the proteins come together, you get reconstitution of nanolock and see a signal um, due to that happening. And so for this example, because we wanted to track calcium flux in the brain, we use CFZ, we use this calcium responsive construct, CAMBI, and then we were able to see, as you can see in the images below, response of calcium flux to foot simulation by these mice. So I've talked quite a bit about Nanoluck and about its potential to multiplex with Firefly. I did want to mention that there are other types of multiplexes which are also relatively new and quite exciting. So this image here is an example of two different Firefly luciferases. One in this case is a mutant version of click beetle green and the other is a mutant version of click beetle red that's referred to as CBG2 and CBR2. And one advantage of this system is that in this case, they both use the same bioluminescent substrate. So with one injection, you can deconvolute whether you're seeing signal from the click beetle green or the click beetle red. And as you can see, you can see that quite nicely in the two different tumors which are on the flanks of these mice. And you can determine the percentages um, from zero to 100% of which enzyme that you're seeing. So this allows you to do to track two different types of biology with one substrate injection. The deconvolution can be a little trickier because you have to collect both um, photons of color at the same time, but it does simplify the experiment and give you an Im one image that you can then deconvolute. And, you know, as I showed previously with this CAR T example, both of these luciferases are multiplexable with nanolux. So there is absolutely no reason you can't actually do a triplex where you have a marine luciferase like nanolux and you have two different firefly luciferases that are spectrally deconvolutable. So with the new luciferase systems, there are a lot of properties that have been improved over the original systems. And this allows for brightness, this allows for tissue permeability, this allows for better fusion properties of luciferase and it allows for some really exciting multiplexing opportunities. And so what I want to end in summary with of my part is just talking about why we are excited about Nanoluck being one of the exciting new luciferases. And I wanna explain that by going through the functions of a really high performing bioluminescent reporter. So really what you'd like is to like have good tissue penetration and as I said, you can get that both through brightness of the luciferase and through shifting the color to the red, both of which are possible with Nanoluck. Um, the size is very important. The um, luciferase promoter is important and, and Nanoluck is compatible with really any reporter. Um, the specific activity, which gives you the brightness is quite important. The stability of the luciferase, um, Nanoluck is quite a bit more stable than most firefly enzymes and most other marine luciferases. Uh, the behavior of the luciferase is a fusion protein. Does it perturb anything that may be fused to? Nanoluck was evolved to not do that. Um, the cofactor dependence. So there are advantages and disadvantages to being ATP dependent. And so there are experiments where you would like ATP independence, as I mentioned earlier with exosomes. So there are definitely are times to choose Nanoluck for its ATP independence. Um, being active intracellularly or extracellularly um, sometimes you want either of those, and Nanoluck can do either. Um, something we haven't touched much upon is immunogenicity. So Nanoluck has very low immunogenicity, even in immune-competent mice. And then, of course, as I have mentioned several times, the properties of the substrate are quite important. You want it to be soluble, non-toxic, and have good pharmacokinetics. And finally, the multiplexing, which, again, I've touched upon quite a bit. So for all these reasons, we think Nanoluck is very exciting. And so having run through um, the new players in the field of the luciferase and the luciferin, I'm now gonna turn it back over to Andrew to talk about the third component of any BLI experiment, which is the instrument you use to detect the light. 
Thank you, Tom. And very interesting. And of course, to wrap things up here, um, once you have a luciferase reporter uh, substrate construct set up, you need to be able to effectively, sensitively, uh, consistently detect the light and analyze it. And this is the role of the uh, in vivo optical imager. So basically, let's just dive in to the essential features of any really uh, top of the line optical imager and what kind of specs that one should be aware of to look for in getting a system that has the capability of really optimizing your in vivo BLI data. Uh, first of all, you want to have, and this may not be completely intuitive, you want to have a robust architecture to the system, uh, one that is highly reliable, um, where all the various component parts have been tested and known to uh, perform consistently over time. Um, some very simple examples include that the light type box that you're using in your imager is in fact light tight and remains so, that the flux rate of your um, uh, fluorescent excitation light remains high, specific, and intense. And once all of the motor functions have been optimized, there is no issue with regard to the overall performance of different fields of view and the camera system operation. So that um, central uh, feature of the system that is, that is a well-built, well-thought-out system is key. Now, the camera system, of course, and its sensitivity is critical. Typically what you'll be using in any optical imager is a cooled CCD camera system. It's gonna be cooled down to minus 90 to eliminate any kind of electronically associated dark current noise. And the uh, technology that is used to keep the camera at minus 90 is a critical component, um, making sure that um, it will operate for uh, hundreds of hours um, is, is, is absolutely critical. And with that, there is the ability to change the field of view of your uh, imaging system. There will be instances where, as we mentioned, you'll want to have high throughput, 10 mouse or five mouse at a time imaging. And there'll be other instances where you'll want to um, elevate uh, the sensitivity of a, a system by getting the target close to the camera. And we'll demonstrate examples of the importance of cooling and of FOV momentarily. For those that are doing fluorescence, a high flux consistent um, uh, fluorescent light source is critical. The use of a uh, system that has a overall system integration for both hardware and software so that the important capability of normalizing all of your optical data, no matter the camera settings, so that for any given target, you will always get the same reported value. This is a central quantitative um, uh, feature of any good optical imaging system. And of course, the interface with the user. You want to have a smart, easy to use software platform. And let's briefly look at the significance of being reliably at minus 90 absolute for your sensor when you're imaging. This is a orthotopic pancreatic cancer model where mice were variably challenged with up to 100,000 cells in the left, 10,000 cells in the middle, mouse two and three, and 1,000 cells um, in the mice to the right, four and five. And what you can see is that there's a nice correlation between number of luciferase expressing cells and signal uh, intensity. What you can also see, however, is that if you take these same five mice and put them into a system that operates at an absolute um, minus 20 uh, degrees Celsius, that the sensitivity for anything less than 100,000 cells is gone. It's basically being hidden by an elevated threshold of, of noise. And that noise will block the lower level signals emitted by the fewer cells in those mice. So cooling your sensor down to minus 90 absolute uh, is really critical. Now, an interesting thing um, that is true with regard to the light physics of any system is that the closer that you get the target to the camera, the more light uh, efficiency you're going to have. And this is uh, clearly demonstrated here with a single mouse at a 25 square field of view versus a six centimeter square field of view. 
you have a multiple fold increase in the total signal detected. So for instances where you're looking at weak signal or you want to absolutely determine exhaustively the actual biodistribution of a uh, bioluminescent cell uh, population of interest, it can be advisable on occasion to use a smaller field of view. And so having a system that can provide both a large field of view for throughput and a smaller field of view for sensitivity is really to your advantage. All right, so I'll end with this. This is an example of uh, how uh, from uh, spectral instance imaging with our standalone Log OX system and our benchtop MEHDX system, we address all these important uh, performance specs of uh, in vivo BLI imaging with the highest sensitivity camera system on the market with really low noise, high throughput capability in the Lago at 10 mice per imaging, five mice per imaging uh, in the Amy HDX, camera cooling in a solid state system that has absolutely no maintenance issues and it will reliably get you down to minus 90 absolute in five minutes, a patented LED uh, fluorescent excitation light array that will give you any light away, a, a whole set of 14 different um, uh, light uh, wavelengths at a high intensity narrow spectrum for a high specificity FLI, the option to field upgrade to X-ray emission filters, or even an access port if you want to thread a catheter into um, a test animal. And of course, we take absolute calibration incredibly seriously in order to get uh, your data to be accurately quantified. Our software Aura is easy to use, it's chock full of features, uh, it's uh, supported nicely by our um, software team, and basically uh, it's very easy uh, to get high throughput imaging data uh, using Aura. The uh, legacy issues are non-existent in that we can read the software from prior systems, and the nice thing here is that the analytical part of the Aura software is, uh, the analytical version is uh, free. You can download it from our webpage and you can do your analysis either in your office or at home, wherever you do um, your research uh, analysis work. Thank you all for joining today. Um, and thank you, Tom and Andrew, for your expertise and presentation today. Um, and we hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.